welcome to the course Introduction to Urban Planning. In today's session, we will start with a new series of discussion on planning legislations. Before we look deeper into particular legislation in the later sessions, in this session we will try to understand the fundamentals behind it. So accordingly, our coverage would include, we will look into legislation, its scope and objectives. We will try to understand rights, its characteristics, legal rights, fundamental rights. We will look into right to property, right of indigenous people. We will further look into the duties of the citizens. We will also look at conflicts through the case studies of various court cases. We will look at the new interventions in this direction such as right based planning approach to urban planning and attaining uh, sustainable development goals. Lastly, we will look at the significance of legislation in the current context. So accordingly, learning outcomes will include that after completion of this session, you should be able to define legislation and review its scope and objectives in the urban planning. You should be able to synthesize rights, its characteristics, legal rights, fundamental rights, rights to property, uh, rights of indigenous people in the current context. You should be able to review the conflict of rights with the planning purpose and process. Further, you should be able to review the court cases to discuss the conflict between the rights and the planning process and the outcomes. You should be able to discuss the new interventions in this direction. You should be able to contextualize the significance of legislation in the current times. Looking at the scope and objectives of legislation, I would like to remind you that we discussed earlier the purpose of planning and looked at 12th schedule that enlist the roles and responsibilities of the urban local bodies in Indian context. Further, we discussed need of power, defined roles, responsibilities, tools, procedure, methods, time frame we discussed on the finance, human resource and information to execute the duties. Further, I would like to add that there are many enablers to attain the objectives such as law, policy, programs, rules, formal and informal. Then we also see incentives, disincentives like fine and other things, penalty. Then we see order, act, social norms. O all these uh, create the enabling environment. We have seen programs incentive through different types and levels of plans within the same structure we covered all of them. In these series, we will talk about law and policy. These enablers, what we talked about, facilitate planning and implementation of projects and programs in a coordinated and integrated manner and provide a platform for a continuous development strategy. These enablers ensure consistency of means and purpose. Uh, you see that we are working at different levels um, and we are dealing with different types of plans and then there are different authorities. So how do we really have consistency of means and purpose and at the same time promote the achievement of national and local economic developmental goals and objectives. Now we look into advanced question. Now we have seen different kind of plans, types of plans, different levels and we have also looked at the uh, urban issues. Now looking at the advanced question once we have made these plans or we are making these plans as a planner or as a citizen, how do we really know what is being proposed or being done addresses the public purpose? What if urban local bodies overstep their powers or have gone beyond the roles and responsibilities to execute their duties? How do we know that our plan or the tools such as the land use zoning, density zoning, height zoning, building regulation, construction or widening of these roads, tax or 
urban redevelopment or renewal of the dilapidated area, land acquisition, provision of selected infrastructure or procedure of decision making or plan preparation or execution or method or time which we gave, information which is disclosed is good or bad. Other questions like whether our plan, tools, procedure, methods are implementable or not. We all need to understand that all the types of plans we had seen earlier when it comes to implementation may interfere with the rights of the people, may restrict their powers. For example, as we had seen in case of Bhopal Development Plan, we created land use zones and fixed FSI. Or in the zonal plan for South Delhi, we plan for infrastructure development which means we restrict people from using their property for certain use only within the land use zone. As well as it means that we might be restricting their property rights in terms of how much they can develop their property with the medium of uh, height zoning or the permissible FSI. So, because of this or because of the infrastructure development, we might be also taking away the development right or completely the ownership from this, which in a way interferes with the right of the landowners to develop his her property to the fullest. So, will it constitute duty of the citizen or violation of the rights? We also see conversion projects in urban core areas, it may also restrict the building use to the owner during the conservation of the project. In this situation, how the urban local bodies or the government entity deliver their roles and responsibilities, from where do they get power or which rules they follow to execute their purpose. Likewise, in our plan, if we plan a road, we might be interfering with the owner's right to even develop his or her property altogether and sometimes may ask the owner to surrender the land for the public purpose project and we may extend a compensation, again depriving them to their right to use their property or own the property. Further, the process how you prepare the plan can itself be questioned for its implementability. For example, if the consent of the majority of the people affected by the project are not taken, the process may be questionable. So, in many ways by exerting control over land as a planner, we interfere with the rights of the people or as a citizen our rights may be interfered with the development proposal. Furthermore, as the citizen we have certain duties for the larger cause and public good. So, amidst all this our rights, the major public purpose and then our duties. So, how do we really work between this? So, the planning entities need legislation which means law, legislation means law, rule or group of laws to exercise power and to execute responsibilities while protecting the right of the people while also making people contribute towards their duty as a citizen. So, let us see how planning entities get the power, what is the source of power. First source of power is the constitution of the country for which we have already seen 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment act in our initial uh, lectures. The state following this uh, constitutional amendment act uh, creates legislation to implement these structures in the state. For the state, the constitution provides directive principles. So, looking at what are directive principles, directive principles of a state policy of India are the guidelines or the principles given to the institution governing the state of India. These are provided in part 4 
of the constitution of the country and are not enforceable by any court. However, the principles laid down are considered fundamental in the governance of the country, making it the duty of the state to apply these principles in making laws to establish a just society in the country. Looking at the directive principles, they are classified under the various categories such as economic and socialist, political and administrative, justice and legal, environmental, protection of monuments, peace and security. Unlike the fundamental rights, the scope of these directives are limitless and it protects the right of a citizen and work at a macro level. These directives consist of all the ideals which states should follow and keep in mind while formulating policies and enacting laws for the country. We further see directive principles are affirmative in directions, so they are positive. On the other hand, fundamental rights are said to be negative or prohibitive uh, in nature because they put limitation on the state. So, the directives is not enforceable by law, it is not justiciable which means it is not capable of being decided by the legal principles or by a court of justice. It is important to note that the directives and the fundamental rights go hand in hand. Directives is not subordinate to the fundamental rights, but they are seen simultaneously. Directives aim to create social and economic condition under which the citizen can lead a good life. They also aim to establish social and economic democracy through a welfare state. They act as a check on the government, theorized as a yardstick in hands of people to measure the performance of the government and vote it out. If the government is not performing, it can vote the government out. As per the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act, this is the SNP taken from URDBFI guidelines 2015 volume 2 page 4. You can see the uh, see that Karnataka has complied with the 74th constitutional amendment act. You can see even Assam state has complied with the um, constitutional amendment act which happened at the central level and then how states uh, translate that. You can consider another example of the act, we can see the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013 and the consecutive amendment adopted. So, we see uh, here state of Karnataka has adopted this uh, amendment uh, in 2019, there is a snip of the document which we see here. You can also see that Jharkhand state also adopted the amendment. Uh, of Land Acquisition Act of 2013. Likewise, we have many acts uh, which facilitate how these objectives can be met without really interfering between the rights and also taking care of the duties and responsibilities of the citizens. We see that uh, we have acts related with legal requirements for industrial development. We see town and country planning acts. We see national heritage conservation related act. We see environment related act. We also see right to information act, contonement act. Uh, which of these some of them selective ones we will be uh, looking at into certain detail in the following lectures. Moving on, we will try to understand rights. I have taken this part from political science literature lessons. This lesson is authored by Dr. Jagrup Kaur. As for the lesson, the concept of rights is regarded as bedrock of democratic system it has been accepted that unless the citizens of the state are guaranteed a certain number of rights, it is not possible for them to live a full life. A right is a claim of an individual recognized by the community and the state. So, if it is your right, it is important that the others recognize it and also the state recognizes it, recognizes it and enforces it. In the words of Dr. Benny Prasad, we see rights are nothing more than or nothing less than social condition which are necessary or favorable to the development or personality 
rights are in their essence aspects of social life. According to another definition, we see a right is a claim recognized by society and enforced by the state. So, this is an important aspect for you to understand. Holland defines right as man's capacity of influencing the acts of another by means of the opinion and force of society. So, now let us look into the characteristic of rights on the basis of the meaning and definition of rights. Rights are the claims of an individual or group of individuals. In fact, rights are the claim of an individual, but not every claim can be right. It is required that a claim should be like a disinterested desire that is in asserting a claim one should feel like rendering a public service. A claim of individual must receive social recognition, it is very important. Since individual's claim is backed by disinterested desire, it receives social recognition. For example, the author gives the example here, an individual's claim that none should take his life receives social recognition as every individual will in the same direction. A recognition of the claim of this type leads to the creation of the rights to people. So, everybody understands that, everybody accepts that. So, thus the claim of individual becomes a right only after it is accepted by the other members of the society. The state does not create rights. So, we see that it is not up to the state to create the right, it only recognizes, maintains and coordinates only so that all may realize the benefits of such rights and in case of violation may protect them. So, the state guarantees equal rights to every citizen. Further, we see that rights are not absolute. That means, no right in a state is absolute and no individual can lay claim to any right in the absolute sense. So, it is very important for us to understand in the Indian context. Rights are limited in their scope and are conditioned by the needs of the entire community. They are subject to reasonable restrictions in social context. There will be disorder in a state if every individual proclaims the absolute nature of his her right. None has the right to spread evil in the society. They are based on the use of intelligence and good behavior. Further, we see that rights and duties are correlated and can never be separated. So, they go hand in hand, every side has a corresponding obligation. The rights of an individual becomes the duties of all others individual of the society. Further, we see right must be definite, right should be universally applicable, they are given equal to all individuals in the society. There can be no discrimination on the basis of religion, race, caste, gender, class or creed. If rights are given to one section of society as against the other, they become privileges. Further, we see that rights have tendency to grow. So, it evolves as our understanding uh, grows, as a context changes, the rights also evolve. With the change in social, political and economic environment and the need of man, the right also grows. So, we need to develop and expand in the rights and therefore, it is said that rights are dynamic. Furthermore, it is said that um, because now we are coming into an era of technology, climate change and scientific development, it is it's time to relook into human rights and to expand the human rights. Further, we see rights are compatible with the common good. The society gives recognition to only those rights which are for the welfare of the society as a whole and which promote some common end or moral good. So, we have seen the characteristics of the rights. On the basis of the characteristic, the characteristics which we saw, it can be said that the rights are those claims that are socially recognized to make life happy, harmonious and prosperous. Also, they are prior to the states, they fulfill the basic conditions of social life. The states 
does not create them, it only recognizes, maintains and coordinates them so that all may realize the benefit of such rights and in case violation may be protected by them. It has also to create those conditions without which man cannot develop his her inherent power and it involves equal opportunities for all. So, we looked into the characteristic of rights based on the meanings and definitions of the rights. So, now we look at the legal rights. So, we are going to just look at the uh, very, very selective components. Legal rights are those privileges of man, women who are recognized, sanctioned and enforced by the state. Their violation attracts penalties. So, if you violate them, you can be penalized for that from simple fine to capital punishment. These rights are embodied in the law of the country. It is important to understand that the test of the legal rights is that it can be enforced in a court of law. So, this can if violation happens, it can be taken to court. So, any bad judgment could lead the planning bodies to the court of law. Government itself has to respect the basic or fundamental rights of the citizen. If citizens are denied these rights, these can be legally and constitutionally enforced. Thus, these rights are recognized by the state and the police and the courts ensure their enforcements. Legal rights may be further classified into civil rights, political rights, civil rights refer to those conditions which are absolutely essential for a civilized life. The enjoyment of these rights facilitate all round development of an individual's personality. They are called civil because they are essential conditions of a civilized society. Civil rights vary from state to state and from time to time. But all the democratic states value them greatly and provide safeguard against their encroachment either by the government or by the individual. These rights are as follows, the right to life, right to life is basic right on which enjoyment of all rights depend. Rights to life as the most fundamental of all the civil rights as it without no other rights is possible. All the states whatever be their stage of political development are duty bound to protect the life of its members. Right to family, further we see right to property. It is one of the most important to understand the problems with the planning domain and considered important civil rights of the man. This right is based on this assumption that owning property is a natural instinct of man and it provides incentive to hard work. The right of property means the freedom to the individual to enjoy his her property. It implies that the individual has the right to acquire, hold and dispose of the property without any restriction or, or hindrance. It also means that uh, he, she individual is free to alienate property by way of gift or exchange or will. So, you should be able to sell it, gift it or you can should be able to exchange it. Most of the democrat states recognize in one form or the other the right to private property and give protection to it. So, we may think of how a proposed plan or an action can restrict or hinder the property right. Looking at the Indian context right to property, right to property is not a fundamental right, but a constitutional right under the article 300A of the constitution. During the first decade of the independence era, it was felt that the right to property as a fundamental right was a great obstruction in reaching the socio-economic order or the goal which we were uh, targeting. In order to facilitate that this right to property was made just the constitutional right and not the fundamental right. So, uh, we see that parliament passed the constitution 44th amendment which made right to property an ordinary legal right under article 300A. In order to overcome the hurdle of development, supreme court in historic case known as fundamental rights case held that the right to property is no part of the basic 
structure of the constitution and therefore parliament can acquire or take away the private property of persons for concerned good and in the public interest. Further we see we have right to freedom of thought and expression this also in uh, we see a lot of conflict with the planning process. Every individual must have the right to freedom of speech and expression without such a right it is impossible for citizens to make their best contribution to the society and the state. F uh, further we see right to form association and move about freely is another right. We uh, uh, see that right of equality. This right is also given great importance in the modern democratic states. This right means the absence of legal discrimination against any one individual group, class or race. Further we see right to education. The state also provides facilities for higher and technical education of the people. We see right to religion, right to contract, right to work. The right to work which is another important civil right is to corollary to the right to live as one who lives has to work. You see many of the government programs aligned with the urban planning address this. We further see the political rights. Political rights are those rights which enable a citizen to participate in the political affair and governance of the country. Uh, we see that the right to vote, right to contest election, right to public office, right to petition, right to criticize the government. So the, these were the political rights. Further moving on we see the fundamental rights. Fundamental rights in addition to the above civil and political rights generally the citizens are granted certain fundamental rights. These rights are described as fundamental because they are fundamental to the development of individual personality. They are superior to the civil and political rights which you had seen uh, because they are incorporated in the constitution. Uh, these rights are justifiable because their violation can be enforced through the courts of law. For any violation uh, you could be taken to court. These rights are also known as constitutional rights because they are enshrined in the constitution. The constitution of India has laid down the fundamental rights of its citizens in part 3 of the constitution. The fundamental rights embodied in part 3 of constitution guarantee civil rights to all Indians and prevent the state from encroaching any individual's liberty while simultaneously placing upon its obligation to protect the citizen's right from encroachment by the society. So the, uh, these rights are applied without discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender and so on significantly fundamental rights are enforceable by the courts subject to certain conditions. So we see that Dr. Ambedkar said that the responsibility of the legislature is not just to provide fundamental rights but also and rather more importantly to safeguard them. We see that there are six fundamental rights of Indian constitution, right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, culture and education right right to constitutional remedies looking at the culture and education rights it guarantees to preserve, maintain and promote the culture and language of the citizens, allows minorities to establish and maintain educational institutions of their own and so on. Further we see rights to constitutional remedies, Indian constitution provides legal remedies for the protection of all these rights against their violation of individuals. The Indian citizens have the right to move to Supreme Court or higher courts for an enforcement of the fundamental rights. So we have seen characteristics and some type uh, of rights. Now we see why are human rights important. As per the UN Habitat 2017 Human Rights in Cities Handbook series explain that human rights are set minimum standards that are essential for people to live in freedom, equality and dignity. They give everyone the freedom of choice and expression and the rights to basic needs necessary for their full development and enjoyment of their rights including education, water, sanitation, food, health and housing. Human rights also protect against their abuse by people or 
entities that are more powerful. Furthermore, human rights inform the relationship that exists between individuals and the governments, distinguishing between every human being and government and non-governmental actors obliged to respect, protect and fulfill these rights. So, these are grounded in international law, fulfilling human rights is legally binding for states upon ratification of human rights instrument. Uh, further looking into what is the source of human rights, we see that um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by UN General Assembly in 1948. This was the first legal document to set out the fundamental human rights to be universally protected. Further we see that Universal Declaration of Human Rights continues to be foundation of all international human rights law, its 30 articles provide the principles and building blocks of current and the future human rights conventions, treaties and other legal instruments. Uh, we see that uh, this uh, UDHR together with the two covenants, uh, the two covenants are the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. These all together make International Bill of Rights. So, this gives nine core human uh, rights treaties which you can see here. The International Bill of Human Rights consists of five core human rights treaties of the United Nation that function to advance the fundamental freedom and to protect the basic human rights of all people. The bill influences the decision and action of the government, state and non-state actors to make economic, social and cultural rights a top priority in promotion and implementation of national, regional and international policy and law. So, we see here some of the important rights by United Nation and Universal Declaration of Human Rights such as right to self-determination, liberty, due process of law, freedom of movement, freedom of thoughts, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, peaceably assemble, freedom of association. For every country, it is the constitution that enforce these rights and further rights are enforced through different schemes and programs through the states. We also see rights of indigenous Adivasi people given in both at the international and national level. United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People provides uh, the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of indigenous people. Uh, in India, we see there are several laws and constitutional provisions such as the fifth schedule for mainland India and the sixth schedule for certain areas of northeast India which recognize indigenous peoples right to land and self-governance. Further moving on, we see fundamental duties of the citizens. So, we had seen all the rights which people have, we have also looked into um, the uh, how states proceeds on performing its duty. Now, we will look at what are the fundamental duties of the citizens. We see that uh, fundamental duties were incorporated in the Indian constitution by the 42nd amendment. There are 11 fundamental duties for Indian citizens drafted on the lines of morals, ethical and cultural code of conduct followed by the people. The duties are educative in nature and direct the citizens to behave in various uh, behave in virtuous and honorable manner. So, these are the 11 fundamental duties which we see of the citizen. We will look into case to understand the conflicts between planning interventions and rights through the case studies. We will look at the case of Olga Tellus versus uh, Bombay Municipal Corporation of 1985. This case is a writ petition filed by lady journalist Olga along with People's Union for Civil Liberties and other organization under Article 32 of the Constitution of India. We see this petition challenged the eviction of pavement dwellers. The petitioner contended that order of the police under section 314 of Bombay Municipal Corporation Act of 1888 is violation of the article 14 which meant equality before law and also article 19 and article 20 which 
address to the protection of certain rights regarding freedom of speech, protection of life and personal liberty of the constitution of India. So, uh, looking at the background of this, we see that in the state of Maharashtra in 1981, the Bombay Municipal Corporation decided to evict the pavement and slum dwellers in the city of Bombay. The chief minister ordered their eviction and then their deportation to the place of origin. This order was under section 314 of Bombay Municipal Corporation Act. The people who were upset with this filed a petition in Bombay High Court for a ban restricting the officer of Bombay Municipal Corporation. The High Court of Bombay granted an ad interim ban to be forced until July 21, 1981 and respondents agreed that huts will not be demolished until October 15, 1981. But contrary to the agreement, petitioners were deported out of Bombay. The respondents challenged this order on grounds that it violates Article 19 and 21 of the Constitution, also sections such as 3. 112 and so on of the Bombay Municipal Corporation Act and it also violates the article 14, 19, 21 of the constitution. You may look at the articles here and you look at the Bombay Municipal Corporation Act of 1888 and see how the conflict arise. This issue involves uh, if you look into it scope of right to life and livelihood under the article 21 of the constitution constitutionality of sections uh, 312 and so on of the Bombay Municipal Corporation Act. There was question of estoppels which means a legal principle that prevents someone from arguing something or asserting a right that contradicts what they previously said or agreed by law. So, the issue was uh, about fundamental rights or the waivers of fundamental rights whether pavement dwellers are trespassers under the IPC. So, looking at the argument of the petitioner, petitioners contended that the right to the life includes right to livelihood under article 21 and this eviction violates this right as evicting the dwellers from the slums and pavements deprives them from the basic livelihood and hence unconstitutional. It was also argued that uh, within certain sections that uh, Bombay Municipal Corporation Act is arbitrary and unreasonable as it includes a provision which gives absolute power to municipal commissioner to evict the persons without requiring any prior notice. So, uh, looking at uh, the decision of the Supreme Court, the right to life has much wider scope. It does not only mean that life cannot be threatened except a procedural established by the law, but as this definition restricts its ambit. The court recognized that livelihood forms a basis of right to life as no person can sustain life without livelihood, not including livelihood in the fundamental rights is the easiest way to harm the spirit of the article 21. The Supreme Court added that deprivation of person from this right should only be in accordance with the law as depriving from this right can lead to deprivation of right to life of a person and not including it in right to life is also in contradiction of the article 39 and 41 of the constitution. The Supreme Court while establishing more stress on the inclusion of livelihood in article 21 also made it clearly visible that such laws can definitely be deprived by the procedure established according to the law. So, thus section um, 312 and so on which empowers commissioner to remove encroachments from footpath and public places cannot be regarded as unjust and unreasonable as these sections are not against the principle of natural justice, but these are acting as exceptional rules, hence they are not arbitrary. So, you see how these kind of actions can really create uh, conflicts with the constitution and the fundamental rights of the people. So, looking at the judgment, the chief justice of India then uh, Chandrachur delivered the unanimous judgment by the five judge bench consisting of himself and the team. Evicted dwellers do not have a right to alternative site, people do not have the right to encroach on footpaths, pavement or any other place served or declared for the public purpose. In the current circumstances 
uh, of Bombay Municipal Corporation, it is not unreasonable. So the action which they had taken were not unreasonable. So this case is stated as an example in which civil and political rights are used to advance social rights and hence the purview of very important right of our constitution. But the problem here is that it failed to provide the right to settlement and led to an injustice somewhere. So that that is as per the review we see. Further now moving on we look qu quickly at another landmark case from New York to understand the conflict. The case of Penn Central Transportation with New York City. Local governments may act to protect sites with historical culture or significance by designating those peoples, uh, those places landmarks. In doing so, government are able to preserve those properties for future generation, but landmark designation restrict the rights of property owners. Owners cannot change landmarks without prior government approval, but they must bear the cost of maintaining the properties up to government standards. So, we look at this particular case. The owner of Grand Central Terminal complaint uh, was against the New York City landmark preservation. Under this landmark law, the Grand Central Terminal, which is owned by Penn Central Transportation Corporation and its affiliates, was designated a landmark and block it occupies a landmark site. So, the appellant Penn Central through opposing the designation before the commission did not seek judicial review of the final designation decision. Thereafter, appellant Penn Central entered into the lease with appellant um, UGP properties where UGP was the construct a multi-storied office building over the terminal. So, uh, according to the appellant it was considered that he was taken away of his property rights because of this limitation on the site. So, the uh, we look at the uh, ruling the Supreme Court ruled that New York City could prohibit the construction of 53 story or office building above the Grand Central Terminal because the tower would significantly alter the terminal status as a historic landmark. Uh, in a 6 to 3 ruling the justice rejected the argument of the owner of a 65 year old railroad station that prohibition represent an unconstitutional taking of their property the airspace above the terminal without just compensation. So, uh, we see this another case which was there. So, now moving on uh, looking at the new interventions in urban planning we see right based approach to development uh, followed in urban planning and uh, attaining SDG. One of the reason the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda are transformative development framework is that they are based on human rights. Over 90 percent of the goals and the targets of SDGs correspond to the human rights obligations. So, we see that how we are heading on this direction and acknowledging more of human rights. So, we see a right based approach to legislation is said to be imperative if the post 2015 goal of sustainable cities and human settlements are to be realized. It is anticipated that this approach will have a profound outcome in realization of other human rights as well. So, it um, envisages that cities and human settlements where all persons are able to enjoy equal rights and opportunities. New urban agenda asserts that inclusivity, non-discrimination and public participation are among its guiding principles. So, we also see apart from this we also see diagnostic tools uh, have been developed to identify the strength and weakness of the legislation in a structured objective and systematic way. The planning law assessment framework developed by urban legislation unit of UN habitat is a quick self assessment tool that aims to identify the strength and weakness of an urban planning law. Uh, it looks at the laws, regulations and decrees that are applicable in a city and enacted at different levels. It has been tested in Colombia, Philippines, Rwanda, Mozambique, Egypt and South Arabia and uh, this looks at gradual fulfillment of rights creating room for necessary societal negotiation about the assort assortment of regulatory system formal and informal and all those and all kinds. So, we see coming to the end we see that effective urban legislation is an indispensable pillar of sustainable urban development as per the urban population is growing at an unprecedented rate it can result in disorder and increased inequality. 
if not supported by effective and clear policy and legal institutional and governance framework. So, we see that it is very important. Good quality urban law provides predictability and order in urban development for a wide range of perspective including spatial, societal, economic and environmental viewpoint. So, we see urban legislation has an important role to play by defining conditions for formal as well as informal access to land, infrastructure, housing and basic services as well as for planning and decision making and pushing for improved livelihoods and living conditions. So, uh, that is all for today summarizing we covered legislation and reviewed scope and objective of legislation and planning we discussed on the rights, its characteristic legal rights, fundamental rights, rights to property. We also looked at the conflicts of rights from with the planning purpose. We also saw the fundamental duties of the citizen as well as we saw the court cases I have just mentioned briefly you can look up in the additional reading. We covered new interventions in this uh, direction as well as we looked at um, the significance of legislation in the current times. Further as we move along in this uh, legislation se uh, section uh, I would request you to keep reflecting on these aspects which you saw today while you look at the various legislation as well as you look into the previous lectures which we talked about the objective and SDGs. Our coverage was limited with the scope to make you aware of the topic. There are enormous readings and movies available to explore. Few are suggested here. This is not an extensive list. You may feel free to suggest more from your experience. Please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about your concerns you have. Do share your opinion, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring cities and urban planning. So, that is all for today. These were our references. Thank you.